policy. He writes a bi-weekly column for the Washington Post and contributes to Postpartisan. He's a senior research fellow at the Institute for Global Engagement Center on Faith and International Affairs and the Roger Hertog Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. In 2005, he was ninth in Time Magazine's feature of the 25 most influential evangelicals in America. He served as a policy advisor and chief speechwriter to President George W. Bush from 2000 to 2006, and was a senior editor covering politics at US News and World Report. His book, Heroic Conservatism, Why Republicans Need to Embrace America's Ideals and Why They Deserve to Fail If They Don't, was published in 2007. He received a degree in theology from Wheaton College, and today we'll be speaking on the moral and strategic imperative of global health and development. Please join me in welcoming Michael J. Gerson. Thank you very much. It's, a, it's an honor to be with you on behalf of the One Campaign. Um, I was involved in three uh, Republican uh, presidential campaigns, traveling the country from place to place, and I've never been to Utah before. Um, and that's really a tribute to the wisdom of Utah voters who didn't need much Republican uh, uh, persuasion, um, but it was a great loss to me. Um, I was really hoping to maybe stay long enough to see the, uh, a, a Cougar football victory, um, but, I, but I'm told I might have to wait a long time. Um, I, today I want to talk to you a little bit about um, some tremendous, unprecedented gains in global health and some uh, problems that could threaten these gains. But first, let me tell you briefly a little bit about myself. Um, Speechwriters are supposed to be anonymous, and at this task, I've succeeded beyond my wildest dreams. Um, I didn't take the typical uh, Washington path. I was a biblical studies and theology major at Wheaton College. Some of you might know the place. It's pretty religiously conservative. I think you're familiar with that. Um, when I went there, there was a joke on campus that the administration had banned premarital sex because it might lead to dancing. Um, <laughs> My uh, first, I, I, I worked on uh, Capitol Hill um, for, for quite a while for a senator, uh, Senator Dan Coats. I was a senior editor at US News and World Report covering politics. And then I got a call from uh, George W. Bush, then governor of Texas in spring of 1999 uh, to meet me at the JW Marriott Hotel in, um, in Washington, DC. And the first thing he said to me in the interview was, this isn't an interview. I want you to write my convention speech, my inaugural address, and uh, my, my announcement speech, my convention speech, and my inaugural address, and I want you to move to Austin immediately. At the time, he wasn't even a declared candidate, um, but he had a courageous, infectious uh, enthusiasm, and I packed up my family and went. Um, from the start, we were a little bit of an odd couple. He's outgoing, social, athletic, likable, and I'm actually none of those things. Um, I found that I didn't have much in common with the governor. He has a penchant, for example, for locker room humor that makes me uncomfortable. Um, I, after one policy session at the governor's mansion, everyone had gone but me. The governor had some time before his next appointment. And I remember him asking me, do you want to hang out a little while? And with a rudeness that now seems crazed, I replied, not really. Um, but he put his arm around me and said, no, you don't do that, do you? But I came to like Bush as a person and a politician. He's a man without a mask. Interest, frustration, sadness, boredom come unfiltered to his face. He is kind and loyal to those around him. And he can be very direct and sharp-tongued. On the day of the State of the Union address every year, the president sits down with all of the network anchors for a discussion. Uh, the late Peter Jennings, I remember, once asked him, what is it like to go before the nation and read somebody else's words? The president immediately replied, you do it every night. <laughs> um, my life changed direction on September 11th, 2001, like the lives of many. I was headed to work on a clear morning down I-395 uh, into Washington when I saw a plane flying low over the highway, so low that I could see the windows. Days later, I sat in the National Cathedral for the memorial service. 
and I saw how in a few historical moments the words, the rhetoric, can really matter to the country. The president said, this world he created is of moral design. Grief, tragedy, and hatred are only for a time. Goodness, remembrance, and love have no end, and the Lord of life holds all who die and all who mourn. Uh, the pace of those years was, at times, exhausting. It has a cost to your health. Um, in December of 2004, while working on the President's second inaugural address, I had a heart attack. Uh, the President's doctor, a wonderful man, had me checked into the hospital under an assumed name to avoid all the press calls. Adding insult to incapacity, there wasn't a single call. Um, and it uh, takes its toll on your family. In the heat of the presidential election of 2004, my little boy, Nicholas, then six years old, announced to me in the car that he wanted John Kerry for president. When I asked him why, he said, so you can be home on weekends. My nine-year-old, who was a little more practical, then asked, but how would we eat? I told him, I think I could get a job, I might work at a think tank, and he asked, of course, what's a think tank? And I told him it's people who read and speak and have meetings and things. And my son said, and this is true, you mean they don't do anything? <laughs> um, after the 2004 election, my job at the White House changed. I became a policy advisor to President Bush on global health development, genocide, areas where my interests had been leading me for many years. And I saw something very hopeful in one of the most bitter periods of partisanship in modern political history. I found a number of issues where members of both parties and people of every ideology have come together. I worked with conservative and liberal groups to fight global AIDS, to confront malaria, to oppose global sex trafficking, to confront the crisis in Darfur. And I've seen some odd alliances grow. Over the years, I've gotten to know Bono of U2 pretty well. A couple of years ago, he invited me to the first rock concert I had ever attended, and it was loud. Um, soon afterwards, my, my wife and I had dinner with Bono, who is a very idealistic and principled man. After dinner, my wife told me, you may be idealistic and principled, but it would also be nice if you were rich and cute, cool. Um, now I'm a uh, fellow at the One Campaign, a bipartisan organization dedicated to the fight against extreme poverty and global disease. Um, over the years, one has campaigned for debt relief and AIDS treatment and the defeat of malaria and clean water and infant and maternal health. It's known for its founder, Bono, but it's respected for its broad, bipartisan, practical influence. I also write a twice-weekly column for the Washington Post, and we're in the middle of a fascinating political season. In fact, I was extensively attacked uh, by name by David Axelrod on CNN last night which shows um, an administration so sensitive to criticism that is using bazookas to, as fly swatters. Um, but today my topic is not political. It is the moral and strategic priority of foreign assistance. Uh, the successes that should encourage us and the serious obstacles that lie ahead. Without a doubt, my best, most vivid experiences in government concern global health. I sat in the Oval Office and watched the President of the United States approve the emergency plan for AIDS relief, the largest program to fight a single disease in human history. I sat in the Oval Office and watched the President approve the President's malaria initiative designed to cut mortality in half in 15 highly endemic African countries. A while ago, I traveled with the One Campaign to Rwanda with Bill Frist and Tom Daschle and John Podesta and others. In Rwanda five or six years ago, about 4% of people who needed ARVs got them, antiretroviral drugs got them. Today that figure is 94%. With American help, Rwanda has cut its death rate from malaria by two-thirds in less than two years, mainly saving children under five. When George W. Bush announced PEPFAR, the emergency plan for AIDS relief, in January of 2003, in the State of the Union Address, there were about 50,000 people on ARVs in all of Sub-Saharan Africa. Today, that figure is well in excess of three million people. These are some of the fastest, broadest achievements in the history of public health. 
and they require some explanation. Inaction on global health requires no explanation. National selfishness is a natural state. Generosity must have a reason. And this reason was a remarkable confluence of events, ideas, and individuals. First, America's domestic fight against AIDS set the stage for this progress. Some expected and predicted that the AIDS crisis in the gay community would increase anger and stigma. Instead, it created a community of effective advocates in America and Europe. It showed eventual success with prevention efforts, and it got policymakers and faith leaders more accustomed to dealing with the issue. In my case, I was introduced to the problem of AIDS when my college roommate died of AIDS in the late 1980s. Many had a similar experience. Second, many started seeing firsthand the scale of the African AIDS crisis. Bono played a key role in raising awareness. Cabinet members, uh, members of Congress, congressional staff came back from African trips with a moral certainty that something had to be done. After traveling with Bono to Africa in 2002, Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill, I remember, said, if you didn't learn something, you're a piece of wood. Third, America was experiencing a period of national wealth and technological advance. Our government had a large budget surplus, and miracle combination drugs were be becoming less and less costly. Initially, ARV treatment caused about $15,000 a year in the West. By the time of the Bush announcement, the cost was about $300 a year for generic drugs. But in 2003, much of this was not new. There had been surpluses for years. The problem had been evident for years. Some principled people in the Clinton administration, such as Donna Shalala, had pushed for action. But little was done. It is an unavoidable fact that many of the top development people in America and the world were deeply skeptical of AIDS treatment. When the UN initially set out its objectives on AIDS, uh, the US fought against the inclusion of an aggressive treatment of a set of aggressive treatment goals. There was no consensus for ARV treatment. In fact, many adopted a, quote, prevention-only approach. And I believe in many cases, this went back to a destructive belief that Africans could not manage a chronic care delivery system. There was a hint of change in the priorities of treatment in the International AIDS Meeting in Durban in, two th in the year 2000. The discourse among AIDS experts began to shift from whether to how to provide antiretroviral therapy. But the biggest source of momentum for treatment came from within government, and it involved a fundamental shift in development theory, a change in vision, which came to be known as the Monterey Consensus. Bush was willing to dramatically increase foreign assistance to nations willing to work as responsible partners dedicated to reform and transparency. The model was partnership, not paternalism, and it involved trusting local people, including Africans. History is pushed by large economic and technological trends, but its shape is ultimately determined by a leader in a meeting in a room with coffee cups around a table. In the Oval Office meeting where PEPFAR was debated, there was an extensive discussion about treatment. Could the money be better spent on other more efficient goals? At one point, National Security Advisor Condi Rice spoke up and talked about her mother, who was diagnosed with cancer when she was a teenager, but lived on cancer treatment until Condi was about 30 years old. Condi said, you bet those years meant something to me, and they would mean something to every African child whose mother lives to take care of them. Ultimately, President Bush believed that Africans were capable of large-scale treatment with large-scale outside help, and that treatment was essential to the stability of whole societies. He bet $15 billion on this belief, and it has been generally justified. About six or seven years into this experiment, some lessons are clear. We have learned that the initial focus on AIDS, rather than health infrastructure or other important priorities, was essential, even unavoidable. AIDS is sometimes viewed as the disease of the poorest. It is not. It takes doctors and lawyers and nurses and factory workers and civil servants the very people who make organized society possible. You see the radiating effects in the health sector 
where one of the main problems in Africa is not only brain drain, but death. In some places in Africa, HIV infections among health workers are twice as high as the general population. You see the effect in education among three million AIDS orphans who are left with no resources and little motivation to attend school. In Zambia at one point, two teachers were dying for everyone that graduated from training school. You see the effect on child and maternal health, not only in mother to child transmission, but also because children with sick or dead parents have higher mortality rates. Untreated parents are less likely to provide care, more likely to carry infections themselves. I remember speaking with an American physician in Zambia who had begun doing treatments in the year 2000. Uh, when he moved to Lusaka, the capital, his daughter attended a school across town. Each school day, he would have to leave about an hour early to navigate the large traffic jams because of the constant funeral processions that went on all day, every day. No society can long survive in the shadow of death. I'll put it bluntly. AIDS uh, relief is more expensive than some other important health and development interventions. But it doesn't matter what millennium development goal on education you adopt. If teachers are dying, it will not be met. It matters little what health infrastructure and maternal health goals you adopt. If parents and nurses are dying and societies are collapsing under the weight of despair, those goals will not be met. Another lesson we learned is that measured outcome goals matter. In older approaches to development, results had little role. American assistance during the Cold War was often used to reward loyalty. European assistance to former colonies was often used to assuage guilt. Most people, frankly, viewed developing nations as basket cases that could not make much progress anyway. But an orientation towards results, accountability, and partnership breaks that pattern. The best African leaders understand that expectations are a form of respect and that those expectations help them to transform their own nations. We've learned that scale matters, that boldness matters. A smattering of pilot projects changes little uh, because they're generally run from the outside. PEPFAR and PMI, the President's Malaria Initiative, took a different approach, national scale-ups with countrywide plans. This demands real development, the creation of supply systems and human resource systems and management systems, the kind of accountability and transparency and professionalism that can bleed through an entire health system and beyond. We've learned that effective aid, like an effective military, requires an integration of efforts in a central command structure. This has been the positive role of the presidential initiative in global health. Before PEPFAR, people working on AIDS in a country from USAID literally did not know their counterparts from CDC, the Center for Disease Control. Um, we could not accurately tell the countries themselves what we were doing in their own countries. American efforts were often diffuse and unstrategic. Given the urgency of the AIDS crisis, we did not have time to reform USAID in the traditional way, but PEPFAR was a kind of ad hoc foreign assistance reform, focusing attention, resources, and personnel on a coordinated effort with measured results. This is the way all foreign assistance should work. We learned that American leadership on global health is important. If we fail, others do not take up the slack. And we've learned that the develop, for development assistance to be broadly supported and aggressively funded, some political and moral arguments must be suspended, particularly arguments on abortion. The coalition that achieved AIDS funding initially and during the reauthorization included both the health community and the conservative religious community. But this was only possible because certain topics were avoided. So progress has been unprecedented. We've learned a great deal in a short time. But the needs, of course, are great and growing. The rate of new AIDS infections is making the goal of universal treatment more distant rather than closer. In 2005, for example, there were 4 million more new infections, far outpacing the growth in treatment. Clearly, in the absence of a vaccine, a new generation of resources and innovation 
on prevention will be necessary. Uh, we need to focus on child and maternal health, on agriculture, on health infrastructure, on women's justice and empowerment. But at the same time, a variety of factors seem to be undermining the priority and appeal of global health spending. President Obama, along with most of the developed world, faces a crisis of competing priorities. We are entering an era of austerity. Deficit reduction will be the main political focus of the next 10 years. Every advocacy group will need to adapt. So far, President Obama has maintained America's development commitments and added a few of his own that are smaller in scale, the Global Health Initiative, the administration's agriculture initiative. Recent American commitments to the Global Fund were welcome, but hardly bold. The fund itself is barely treading water. I also have serious fears about the direction of Republican ideology. In this economic environment, and without President Bush, it will be easy for Republicans to return to an anti-government default position on foreign assistance, adopting a kind of moral isolationism. It is very difficult at this point to judge what a Tea Party foreign policy might look like, but it is unlikely to be enthusiastic about foreign aid. And we are seeing at the edges strains on the diverse ideological coalition that produced PEPFAR. Recently in Canada, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton made the case that maternal health is inseparable from abortion rights. I know, the argument on, I know there are arguments on both sides of, of this issue, but pressing this argument is a mistake. If the Obama administration and global health advocates place abortion rights at the center of the development of agenda, they will not only solidify conservative opposition on child and maternal health, they will undermine Republican support for development spending as a whole. The coalition for foreign assistance is fragile, and this debate could break it beyond repair. So briefly, how do we respond to these challenges and get through this period of economic emergency and tight resources? How do we navigate this storm? Let me leave you with just a few thoughts. First, there's the intellectual task to assert that robust foreign assistance is a centerpiece of American foreign policy. While the political consensus for foreign assistance is fragile in America, the intellectual consensus is strong and bipartisan. Conservative and liberal thinkers, realists and idealists, generally understand that the worst challenges in our world, terrorism, drug trafficking, human trafficking, criminal gangs, refugees, pandemics, emerge from weak states ungoverned regions and hopeless parts of the planet. And by encouraging hope and progress in health and good government, we add to the security of America and to the peace of the world. A world of misery is a world of danger. A world of hope and progress tends toward peace and stability. This consensus is embraced by leaders from Colin Powell to Bill Frist, from Henry Kissinger to Secretary Robert Gates, was called for, quote, a dramatic increase in our civilian instruments of national security. It is General Petraeus who insists, quote, the human terrain is the decisive terrain. A fascinating recent poll found that 84% of the post-9-11 military officers believe that strengthening development and diplomacy is equally important to our national security as improving our military capabilities. Second, we need to respect and maintain this unlikely coalition between religiously informed conservatives and the more liberal foreign assistance community for the sake of the most vulnerable people in the world. Third, Americans need to get involved. African leaders have little access or influence in the American Congress. The sick and dying of the developing world have no voice of their own in Washington. And someone must provide that voice. Moral causes matter little until they are embodied in political movements. This is the theory of the One Campaign. And campuses across America are the soul and center of this activism. I'd encourage you to join the One Campaign. Make the moral and foreign policy case on campus. This is a cause that will justify all your effort and idealism. People concerned about these issues will need to be vocal beyond their numbers. And this is the comparative advantage of the college student being vocal. Finally, and most importantly, 
Americans need to hear the stories of success. Many people, in my experience, have never heard a single success story with foreign assistance money. They think it is thrown down a rat hole of waste and corruption, but it is not. It has done miracles. The One Campaign has a program called Living Proof, which is designed to highlight these gains. I'd urge you to look at the material on uh, one.org. Most people in America have no idea that the number of children out of school globally decreased from one, 105 million in 1999 to 72 million in 2007, in part because of debt relief. Or that child deaths have been declining steadily since the 1960s due to immunizations, vitamin A supplements, the use of malaria nets and other interventions. Or that the Gavi Alliance, the uh, vaccine alliance, launched in 2000, um, has helped to prevent perhaps five million deaths since it was created. Or that in 2008, for the first time, the number of AIDS deaths in the world declined because new people were getting on treatment at faster rates. But for me, the most compelling, compelling stories have come firsthand. A few years ago, I was in Ethiopia and vi visited an orphanage run by the Sisters of Charity in Addis, an outpost of clean and cheerful order in the sprawling chaos of that city. The Sisters care for 400 orphans, all of them HIV positive. Some lost both parents to AIDS, others were abandoned. Walking through the dorms, there are hundreds of neat little beds. The last dorm is decorated with a large mural covering one wall of Jesus and the children. Each of the six or seven children in the mural is the portrait of a child who had died at the orphanage. Sister told me the children still come in to talk and play with them. Many of the children, she said, quote, have an easy death. One three-year-old boy, she recalled, called for her in the middle of the night, thanked her for everything she had done for him, and told her that he would die before morning, which he did. Others have a harder time, quote, they tell me, sister, why can't you come with me where I'm going? Why do I have to go alone? But a couple of years ago, thanks in part to the American people, the AIDS drugs began arriving. I visited a nursery filled with babies on ARV treatment. Two toddlers had become blind because of AIDS, but had had their sight restored by the drugs. Almost no children are dying at the orphanage, and the sisters are starting to plan for job training for the 16-year-olds who eventually begin a new life. This is truly a modern miracle, and Americans should know about it and be proud of it. Government service always has many frustrations and failures, but having seen and held those children, I can never be cynical about government. I have seen what it can accomplish when Americans have a bipartisan commitment to a great goal, a great object. Thank you very much. Happy to take a few questions if there's time. So again, you know the routine, we'll bring the mic to you. Just tell us your name and what you're studying and ask a question. Hi, my name is Paul Russell. I'm an international relations major. Um, I think some people would argue that the sort of treatment programs that you're talking about aren't very sustainable as far as aid money goes. Do you think that the One Campaign is looking or has looked or can look in the future towards microfinancing as a w means of um, improving poverty across the, uh, the globe? You know, there, once you begin to do AIDS treatment, th there are kind of a series of radiating, uh, kind of a, a radiating learning process that goes on. Most of the uh, AIDS treatment programs eventually have some micro-enterprise element because the women themselves need to, need to um, engage in sustaining uh, efforts. Some of them do agriculture. Uh, you know, they eventually turn to this issue of, of people sustaining themselves. Um, so on one level, I think that uh, when you have people that are living, <laughs> um, that uh, who, who were dying in the past, um, that there's a very natural progression to uh, microfinance and other kind of things that make uh, the situation more sustainable. If you're talking about 
broader health systems being sustainable. I, this is a major challenge. I mean, you, when you, right now, in the absence of a vaccine, and the research on the vaccine is unfortunately quite uh, disappointing, um, that uh, any new person that goes on, on the drugs is a lifelong commitment. Um, and um, so we're, that was part of the reauthorization process um, in the last year of the Bush administration. Uh, on PEPFAR was to try to take it from being an emergency plan for, to something where it's more sustainable. And that's gonna require countries themselves to spend more of their own national income on health programs, which they're beginning to do. Um, I, so it, uh, you know, uh, AIDS treatment in a lot of ways is a, uh, is staunching an open wound, it's a bandage. Um, and a lot is going to de depend on progress on the prevention side, um, which is very variable. There are some places, particularly in Central Africa, Kenya, Uganda, where they've had tremendous success in reducing the level of new AIDS infections. There are other places, Botswana, South Africa, where the, the, the news is really not good. Um, and, um, and so people are going to have to take that seriously on the prevention side. On the financing side, you know, a lot of what we did in PEPFAR uh, was um, trying to get the capacity for treatment up as quickly as possible. Now there's much more of an emphasis on making it sustainable by building health infrastructure. Um, that's part of what the president's uh, global health initiative is about. Um, and uh, that, I think, is going to be uh, very important as well. Um, but the, the reality here is that it's gonna require not just continued commitments from the West, but to, uh, to continue the progress that's been made, it's gonna require increased commitments from the West. And that's a, it's very tough in this environment. Um, we're already beginning to see in countries, you know, I, I know some of the health officials in Uganda, um, where they're getting the word from USAID, don't put new people on treatment. Uh, the administration disputes that that word is getting out, but it's somehow getting out um, because they know there are resource constraints and limitations. Um, and, I, and they're already seeing the effects. Um, people are less likely, when if, you're, if treatment's not available, they're much less likely to be tested, um, which is the key to all prevention. Um, why in the world be tested if they don't have a, the, uh, at least the a reasonable shot at, at, at treatment? Um, you're beginning to see people, to see people do pill splitting and other things, which is, it creates resistance problems, um, which is a big problem with AIDS that you're gonna eventually need second line drugs, third line drugs, and uh, you know, as resistance increases. Um, you're seeing people return once again to uh, uh, native healers, to you know, tribal healers, um, which uh, often have, not always, but often have bad in effect on, in, in, AIDS, in AIDS treatment. Um, although I would say that tribal healers sometimes can be brought in as part of the solution on, on these questions. Um, and so, uh, you know, my real concern is you can't, you can't maintain the progress by maintaining the level of funding we have now. You actually start to the progress starts to degrade unless you uh, get on a path towards increased treatment in, the, in these countries. Um, and, uh, and that, I, you know, and it's the way, you know, that's our comparative advantage in the West is, is resources when it comes to this. Uh, David Newell, Sociology. Um, I share your optimism about many of the advances we've made in global health in terms of development. Uh, in terms of economic development, on the other hand, uh, the evidence is much less clear-cut. Uh, what are your feelings about economic development as related to health development, and are there inroads for potential progress that you've seen? It's a very good point. You can, and because I've looked at the modeling when we did the President's Malaria Initiative on global health initiatives like this, you can reliably predict 
what the output outcome will be given a dollar's input into a program like that. That's much harder to do on long-term economic development. In fact, the, uh, you know, the evidence seems to indicate that there's very little correlation between development inputs and economic growth. Okay. Um, now, I think you know, this, this all has to be tested, and it's in the process of being tested. Some of that is because, as I mentioned in the, in the speech, that no one ever intended the money to, to, you know, to have any development effect. Okay. You know, when you give more money to a Cold War proxy, uh, that, you know, you're essentially buying influence. You're not uh, promoting growth. Um, or in a post-colonial situation where uh, you know, you're just doing government to government transfers. Um, and um, so I don't think there's even been much of an intention <laughs> to have, to have uh, long-term economic uh, effects. But we, you know, we attempted to begin, or at least began to shift that with the um, Millennium Challenge account, okay, which I don't know how much you're familiar with, but th this was an attempt to fairly dramatically increase uh, development assistance, long-term economic development assistance in countries that came up with uh, well-developed uh, plans that included uh, transparency, good government, investing in their people, you know, health outcomes, and um, a series of, uh, of requirements um, in order to justify this lar these large increases in development assistance. Um, and, uh, and that program has only been implemented for a few years. Um, uh, some of it looks very, very promising. I mean, you, you have, uh, uh, you ha you've had uh, you know, a dynamic at work that's been called the MCC effect, by which countries, in order to compete for this money against one another, are actually undertaking significant reforms. Um, women's justice and rights reforms, economic transparency reforms, good government kind of reforms. Um, so you hope that, the, you, you know, that that kind of aid is going to have a better outcome. Um, I, the, the economic reality here, uh, which I'm sure all of you know, is that aid flows are a very small portion of uh, of e you know, economic advancement and growth in the developing world. Um, almost all of uh, you know, economic growth takes place because of direct foreign investment, trade, and, um, and local investment, actually, with investment within the country with its own resources. Um, those sources of capital and growth dwarf development assistance as, a, uh, you know, as categories. The question is whether you can use long-term economic development system uh, assistance as a way to create environments in which all of those other things are more productive. Okay, whether it's you know ease of business incorporation, or whether it's uh, rule of law issues, or whether it's uh, uh, corruption and transparency issues. Um, and so I I don't think we're we're particularly good at doing those sort of fine-tuned interventions. But there's at least now an attempt um, through the MCC uh, to, uh, to specifically uh, you know, foster a set of reforms that are more likely to lead to economic growth. Uh, my name's Aaron Day, and I'm a history major. My question to you is, uh, Many have recently commented that foreign aid should be used as a tool for national security. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that that is what will happen in the future, that foreign aid will be used as a national security tool? And if that were to happen, do you view that as morally, morally wrong? Well, you sometimes get that criticism, even from people I worked with at USAID, that fear that, uh, that believe that aid should not be instrumental and things like that. And the reality is, that much of the aid we do is not instrumental. I mean, we do a lot of emergency response aid, for example. America does that better than anyone else in the world, okay? As far as food relief and other things. Th that's done out of humanitarian need and, and uh, 
you know, we are the main funder of the UN uh, approaches on these issues. We are the main funder on refugee uh, assistance issues. Um, and those things are not, you know, foreign policy strategic commitments for the most part. They're done in, in, in a different, in, in different ways. And that's a significant portion of what we do. Then there's a portion of aid that's just purely security related. I mean, we give money to you know Egypt and Israel and, and other things. I mean, we still give billions of dollars to Egypt every year in payment for the Camp David Accords, essentially. You know, and that's uh, I, I, I don't having spent time in government, I don't regard that as immoral. I, I think that it serves the Ameri I mean, the national interest. The president has a duty to serve the Constitution. That's his primary job, and the, his fellow citizens. And you know those determinations are important, but I think then there's a whole category of spending, in which our investments are both uh, fit our interests very well and fit our ideals very well. Um, you know, if if you look at uh, that band of conflict across the center of Africa, where the Muslim world meets the Christian world, and the uh, the resources that are there, the threats that emerge in the, in those con contexts, the humanitarian nightmares that come in Sudan, Somalia, or other places. Um, I, you know, I think that America, in the long run, our interests are undermined by instability in that region, and I think that our values are served by promoting hope and and uh, uh, you know and stability. Um, you know, we're, I, I do believe that America is a different kind of power than say. Uh, you know, the normal balance of power politics of kind of tr the traditions of Europe. I mean, we benefit. It's been our theory, our foreign policy theory since uh, Franklin Roosevelt at least, that uh, Republicans and Democrats, that we benefit from the expansion of a liberal, uh, social, political, and trading order in the world, small l liberal. Um, that our interests are served when Europe resolves its internal ideological conflicts and you know, accepts kind of at least the, 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 kind of the principles of democratic self-government. And, uh, and so it's not, it's not really a, uh, a zero-sum game in this, in, in most circumstances. I mean, we really do have a kind of confluence of our interests and our ideals when it comes to foreign assistance for the most part. 